I'm a rolling stone, all alone and lost, for a life of sin. I have paid the cost when I pass by. All the people say, it's another guy on the lost highway. For a deck of cards and a jug of wine, and a woman's lies makes a life of mine. I'm lost, too late to pray. It's a rambling down this lost highway. Boys, don't start running around on this road of sin, this sorrow bound. Take my advice, for the curse today, holding down that lost highway. the window, listen to the radio, baby wants me to stay, but I think I'm gonna go. If I had a dollar, I'd stop by that the corner store, buy myself a popsicle, take her to the disco. <laughs> that line is the whole song. That's the whole hook to that song. And I didn't write it. The original line was... If I had a dollar, I'd go up to their tummy toe. Buy myself a popsicle because you know she's just as cold. That was the original. Buy myself a popsicle because you know she's just as cold. That's really hard to even say, let alone understand. But that was the first recorded version of that song on the Jason and the Nashville Scorchers EP. And uh, I sent the EP when it came out to my brother, Jerry. And uh, he you know, gave me his comments on it. He said, Man, I love that line in Help, There's a Fire. It's one of the coolest lines you've written yet. That line about, buy myself a popsicle, take her to the disco. That's how he had heard it, you see. And I said, yeah, I'm a lyrical genius, no doubt. You know, I think that's a really good line, too. Buy myself a popsicle, take her to the disco, baby. You're like a bird out on a wall. Every time I get next to you, you holler out, help, there's a fire. Rolling down the highway, nothing left anyway. Trying to make a sense out of changing every night and day. Want to be your lover, but you tell me that I'm just a kid. Got another guy around, give you loving like I did, baby. You're like a bird out on a wall. Yeah, yeah. Every time I get next to you, you holler out, help, there's a fire. Let that sucker burn. Baby, you're like a bird out on a wall. Every time I get next to you, you holler out, help, there's a fire. All right, thanks for sticking around, everybody. I appreciate it. I know it's a cold January night. I know it was five below zero two days ago. That's not much of a bar to get above. Here's a song off Stand Tall, and uh, it's a true story.
Crazy John from early on Knew he was singing in a different song Knew he was marching to a different beat Like his quiet cousin down the street but Then one day he finally knew His path in life and what to do John the Baptist was a real homedinger he could scream the truth like a drunk folk singer. Wandering the hills of Galilee, whipping up crowds to a wild frenzy, standing tall like an old gunslinger. Yeah, John the Baptist was a real humdinger. John the Baptist heard one voice that guided him through every choice. He'd yell at all the priests and frauds, abstain from sin and turn to God. While down the road his cousin dear was sowing hope and killing fear. John the Baptist was a real humdinger. Touching the souls like an old blues singer. Wandering the hills of Galilee, living on the edge, wild and free. The go to guy, the perfect ringer. John the Baptist was a real humdinger. King, he ruled the land with Roman spears and bloody hands. But John was not afraid to say the truth to him, come what may. No, Herod couldn't break his mind. Briberies or prison time. John the Baptist was a real humdinger. He could work a room like a rock star singer. Wander in the hills of Galilee, living on bugs and raw honey, an angry wasp with a lethal stinger. John the Baptist was a real humdinger. John held his ground Although he could have brought the empire down But he stood up for his truth And gave away his fame and youth Simply to prepare the way For all the souls his cousin saved John the Baptist was a real humdinger Spitting words like a punk rock singer. Wandering the hills of Galilee, whipping up crowds to a wild frenzy, standing tall like an old gunslinger. John the Baptist was a real humdinger. Yeah, John the Baptist was a real humdinger. Yeah, John the Baptist was a real humdinger. Yes, he was. Is. Last time I sang that song publicly was at the Grand Old Opry. That's the truth. And Kristen and Mike were there that night. That's right. Cardiac workout. That's what the announcer said. <laughs> I knew I had it. I knew I had the record. This one had, it gave the record teeth. Um, it's a song called I Rode with Crazy Horse. And um, thank you. Appreciate that.
Crazy Horse was a magnificent human being. He was a magnificent American. He, um, in the broadest, best sense of that word, he was the leader of the Lakota and the Oglala in the 1870s, one of the war chiefs. Now, the Oglala Cheyenne Lakota alliance in the in the 1860s was one of the most powerful military organizations on the planet Earth. They were able to they had been able to fight off the white invasion, outnumbered and outgunned, you know, for 20 years. They were more powerful than most European nations. They were they were a solid, strong military. And one of the reasons why was because Crazy Horse was a military genius. But not only that, he was, he was a holy man as well. He was a complex individual. He killed people to save his tribe, but he also loved his tribe and his people to the depth of his being, and he would give his life for anybody. All these great stories about how he would, he would you know, give his... His, his wealth, which to the Lakota and, and to the Oglala and Hunkapapa Sioux was, was their, their food. And he would give these old folks that didn't have anybody to hunt for them anymore, he would give them his food, give them his food. And he kept them alive in the winter times, in those crazy, awful winters in what is now Montana and North Dakota. And he also was this sort of shaman man as well, shaman. He was just an incredibly, and we know so little about him. Most of the, most of the, of the late 19th century Indian chiefs, we know quite, quite a bit about John Moe, Sitting Bull, Chief Joseph. Um, we, we just know a lot about those folks. They lived a long time, but, but Crazy Horse didn't. He didn't last only a few months in captivity before he was murdered. Um, and there's this legend among the Lakota that he had this friend or a cousin that fought with him all the way through. This cousin also stood by him. He, he went through this sort of, he had some sort of affair and almost was kicked out of the tribe when he was young, Crazy Horse. And he stood, he stood you know, this, this cousin stood by Crazy Horse and he was there at all the major battles that Crazy Horse was in. Battle of a Hundred Hands, Battle of... of uh, a greasy grass, um, and then on to Fort Robinson. And the rumor is that he was with Crazy Horse's parents when they dug up his corpse and buried it in a secret spot so it wouldn't become commercialized. So, wow, you know. I'd been wanting to write a song about Crazy Horse for a long time, but there's been so many great books and songs already written about him, so, but nobody ever written a song about that, his cousin. That's what I did. Once I rode with Crazy Horse I stood by him through his divorce. I stood by him when others ran. I stood by him when war began. I have no shame or dark remorse. Once I rode with Crazy Horse. I say this year is 1904. You're a college professor Here to write down what I say From the days so far away And that our cause you do endorse Well, once I rode with Crazy Horse bum bum ba da 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 dum bum ba da bum ba da 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 dum Sharpen up your pencil good Finally I'll be understood At Greasy Grass we face Custer 
and all the power he could muster. I did my part to reinforce when I rode with Crazy Horse. It wasn't all that long ago We fought white men in the snow We fought the crow and Blackfeet too We fought folks that look like you I don't care much for you, of course But once I rode with Crazy Horse Well, finally, our tribe surrendered. The reservations all dismembered. But a few of us stayed out. For a year we fought the doubt That we could beat relentless force When I rode with Crazy Horse On his day of reckoning I stood by my friend and king Some fools from our own reservation the hero of our nation I tried to take that blade of course when I rode with crazy horse Buried him where no one knows, where no one looks and no one goes, so no one can desecrate or commercialize his final fate. By a dried up water course, when I rode with Crazy Horse. My wife died in 1901. This reservation's lots of fun. I sit around to get my food, and whiskey puts me in the mood. I scream until my voice is hoarse. And once I rode with Crazy horse, 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 yes I did. After 45 years playing music professionally, I'd know to have a spare guitar. <laughs> Note to self, get a spare guitar, dude. Um, but this is okay because this is the perfect opportunity to do... I tell you what, is there a guitar... John, can you change the string on this real quick? get to the moment that you've all been waiting for, <laughs> the Jason Ringenberg Most Obscure Song Request Contest. And folks, I do totally get the irony that almost all my songs are really obscure. <laughs> so you know, pretty much pick anything. You've got a chance of winning. Um, but first, the, the prize we're going to give away is, hold on a minute. This summer, our, the manager of Jason and the Scorchers was named Jack Emerson. He was the first person I met when I moved to Nashville in the summer of 1981. 
And he helped me start, Jason, in the Nashville Scorchers, and he was there through all the, all the big years in the 80s. Jack was like a brother to me. And um, anyway, um, his widow was cleaning out their storage bin this summer. It had been a storage bin that he'd had since those days. He just put his stuff in storage, all climate controlled. And he found several hundred copies of the Jason, the Nashville Scorchers Fervor LP, <laughs> sealed in mint condition. <laughs> so that's one of the prizes. If you already have this, and if people have been buying it, um, then you can have the alternate prize, which is a handwritten lyric print for Harvest Moon. So. The, I have to say, this is a really good request this time that I've never had. But I've had some good, some good ideas. Um, two folks wanted to hear I want to be sedated. Uh, <laughs> so I have done that. That's right. My, or one person, Mike Hansen, who's an old friend of the Hansen. I'm an old friend of the fa Hansen family. And I have done I want to be sedated, the Ramones song. Um, yeah, Roger's here too, right? Roger's here. And... Let's see. And is Mike here too? Right, right. And Joe, I mean, Joe, Joe's here. We got the whole Hanson crew together. I thought you all hated each other. What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that's a joke. Um, right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> God bless the Hansons. Um, uh, Someone wanted uh, the Steve Earle song, Someday. I've never sang it. Sorry, I've never sang it. Um, and Mark Jensen, Jerson, Jensen, I wanted to hear God bless the Ramones, God save the Ramones. Um, so we might get to that a little later. Um, but the winner of tonight's contest is a really obscure song that I only sang in college at Western Illinois University. I went down to Western Illinois University for one year. And... Uh, simply because my brothers and sisters all went there, so I just kind of went in the furrow and went there. And then I transferred to Southern, and that's where I got corrupted by music. So, but anyway, at Southern, I was, I was playing, you know, little, little dorm room things and stuff, and I had this song. Um, Ken Rose, are you here, Ken? You're a good guitar player. She'll have, you changed the string. You're Ken, Roger's brother, right? Day gone. This is fantastic. So, Ken, you're a really good singer and guitar player. You, you played that one McCartney song so beautifully. What, which, and you can play Fogel, Fogelberg all night. You, you, God, great. Sorry, you're still picking. So, um, Ken chose a song I sang in those days called Cross of Desire. And I haven't sang it since those days. I can promise you that. But anyway, you're the winner. Would you like the, um, the Harvest Moon or would you like the Fervor? Or um, do you like LPs? Does Roger like LPs? Yeah. Okay, uh, this is for Roger. I'll give this to Roger. Yeah. Um, so are you in the area now, Ken? like in a Scorchers tour once in the 80s. So, so, so it's tell him I said hello. And a big fan. Thank you, Ken, for coming out. I think I, um, I think it needs a battery, actually. Thank you, John. Thank you. I was going to wait till after the like if I do an encore to say this, but how about just a gigantic hand to all the Heartland Connection people, especially John Taylor, yay! <laughs> Bringing all this music every week. He has two shows, two shows this weekend, me and if, you know, and um, who's tomorrow, John? Cool, Brother Moses, yeah, all right. Okay. Cross of Desire, all right. Well, I said I'd try it, so I will. <laughs> I was also going to wait till later, but I'll say it now that 
How many of you folks are from Western? How many? Just raise. Wow, so like almost half the audience. <laughs> 77, I graduated, yeah. I know I don't look that old. But. All right. But I wanted to say this. I did. Um, you know, I was just kind of this weird, dweeby kid who didn't really fit in all that great, you know, my first three years. And then I started playing, I started writing songs the summer of my senior year, the fall of my senior year. And... Uh, I played the songs for my English class, and Kristen, you were in that class, and nobody laughed, and everybody liked it. And I always remember, like, wow, if you guys would have, like, man, that's really horrible. <laughs> let's, let's go back to studying Shakespeare. You know, uh, I may not ever have done it. And I'll, I'll extend that even farther. You know, high school kids can be incredibly cruel. That's just the way it is, especially in the 70s. But... To a person, everybody gave me support when I started playing, you know, those songs in, those, in, that, little, in that little high school in Buda Western. And had I not had that support, I may not have done it, you know, because you're really impressionable when you first start out. So I just thank all you folks that, that you're, most of you that were, gave me that strong support are here tonight, you know, you know, Kristen, of course, and, and Jeff, and the Hansons, and um, so thank you, and also thank you, I had a, a Barb DeBolt, of course, I've known Barb since I was four years old, you know, we were neighbors, you know, we were neighbors, our dads were friends and farmed together, um, and my, one of my f best experiences in high school was uh, my senior play, and Gay Abrams, who's here tonight, directed that play, so thank you, Gay, for, I sang a song that night, yeah, yeah, a secret, Julie Gage was the co-star, I sang a song to her, you know, it was written in, you know, I, I, but I did, I did write the song, but it was written to sing a song to the, to the other starlet, and I had a crush on Julie, it was really easy to write. <laughs> <laughs> well, you most, all the time, Kirsten, you know. <laughs> okay, I really am a professional, folks, I swear, I really do know how to do this. Um, yeah, this thing won't tune. Um, but in the words of the immortal Jimi Hendrix, we tune because we care. All right. So, <laughs> that's horrid. What? Okay, what? Ken, I might need your help. Okay, that's good. Okay, that's not bad. Okay, that's acceptable. Okay. Sharp, right? Right, okay. Oh, that's the wrong one. <laughs> okay, that's the wrong one, Ken. You got it. All right. Come on. The audience is turning on me. Okay, here we go. Cross of Desire. Wow. Okay, I don't remember the chorus. I don't remember the verses. <laughs> I don't remember how to plug in my guitar. <laughs> what town are we in again? I think it was in the key of E minor. Cross of desire, tremble into the dawn. Blow the ship of dreams that I once rode upon. My tears shatter the shore now. Finally, I'm the one who must cry. I gaze through the window and how I wish it was her eyes. Oh, God, that's horrible. <laughs> but, but I did it. Okay, we got a verse out of it. Very good. I have somehow, somehow, I have resisted the temptation to write an anti-Nashville song. All country artists, all country, especially all country rock artists, eventually in their career write an anti-Nashville song. Robbie Folks, you know, Nashville sucks, that song. Everybody does. 
but I resisted the temptation until this record. Because, I mean, Nashville has lost its soul. <laughs> you know? There's no other way, there's no other way to, to, to call that, you know. The, the growth in the city has just gone unabated without any respect for the history of the town. And um, nowadays, the Chamber of Commerce, they don't talk about, you know, Chris Christopherson lived there and wrote Me and Bobby and McGee in Nashville. They don't write about that. They write about Nashville is now the number one destination for bridal um, shower advance thing, whatever that's called, you know, the, the advanced bridal party. Right, right, yeah, right, Nancy, right. right. Or they brag about that Nashville has more, more per capita pedal taverns in any city in the world. Wow, let's be proud of that. So, I had to write this song. This is called Nashville Without Rhinestones. Nashville without rhinestones, it's closer than you think. Throw your records in the sea and listen to them sink. The town has been corrupted, its soul is now for sale. Nashville without rhinestones, it'll be a perfect hell. Though the prophets say it's coming But this time it won't be dimes The musicians will be bumming Folks in condominiums Will drink a victory toast Nashville without rhinestones Yeah, they will proudly boast Without rhinestones, no, not a single one. They have all been traded in for camouflage and guns. Cadillacs and telecasters all will be forgotten. Nobody will sing about hogs or picking cotton. Stones, you think that I've gone mad? Trafficking and feelings too numb to make you sad. But out on the horizon, I see a sinking ship filled with hillbilly ghosts on their final trip. Yeah, filled with hillbilly ghosts on their final trip. Folks, they'll cheer, drown themselves in burgundy or local crafted beer. Me, I think I'll step aside and play an old LP. Soaked in sweat and sorrow in 1963. Yes, yeah, soaked in sweat and sorrow in 1953. Yes, soaked in sweat and sorrow from 1943. Yes, soaked in sweat and sorrow from 1933. Yeah, born of sweat and sorrow from 1923. Across the valley that was steeped in blood. My virgin pain was simply not enough To satisfy the one thing in life that you still desire A dress of lace and a pint of gin A little heaven and a needle full of sin 
And do the sights you remember scare you less than the sights you left unseen? But I can't go on living in your broken whiskey glass. Someday you'll find an appetite that reads. Here lies Jason. Strangled by a love that wouldn't breathe. Strangled by a love that wouldn't breathe. Went to church in your party dress, trying to live those blues that you read. From a rock and roll magazine so neat and clean. Try to fight through the emptiness I feel every time you undress. Girl heroes will fade away when the morning rain shines down. I can't go on living in your broken whiskey glass. Today you'll find an appetite that reads. Here lies Jason, strangled by a love that wouldn't breathe. Strangled by a love that wouldn't breathe. You went to Memphis to find yourself. Read every Elvis book on the shelf. Like the pillar two to feel like a honky tonk star. But the river didn't seem so wide. You were looking out, not inside. And white soul heroes are made of more than legends, trashed up dreams. You can't go on living in your broken whiskey glass. Today you'll find an appetite that reads. Here lies Jason. Strangled by a love that wouldn't breathe. Strangled by a love that wouldn't breathe. And that goes out to all the very early fans of Jason and the Scorchers especially my friend Joe Carper. I remember when he first, that record first came out and I was talking to Joe, we were hiking around the track at the Sheffield School and he said he really dug that song. And I just, because Joe's not the kind of guy that just goes throwing out compliments right and left, so when he, when he said that, I was like, okay, yeah, this, this, this is a cool song, that's right. And Joe, how, how do you keep looking like you're still 20 years old? How do you do that, brother? Wow. Let me know the secret. All right, folks, I'm going to do one more song for you. Um, but I'm going to tell a really long story before doing it. So if you're like wanting the show to be over, this, this is not the news you want to hear. If you want to hear more, you're in the right place because this story is really a long one. Um, once again... I go back to the Sequoia National Forest for this, National Park for this song. Um, I had written um, John Muir Stood Here and another song that made the uh, Rhinestone record called uh, My Highway Songs. I'd written them both that day. And this song was the kicker, though. This is the one that really drove that whole record. It kind of became like a kind of a, a little bit of a, what do you call it when a song, viral, that a little bit of a viral thing happened with it. Um, I was hiking around and I came around upon a grove called the, um, called the Charles Young Grove, and Colonel Charles Young Grove. And I was like, oh, well, this is cool. It was a really beautiful grove, and, and I, I was wondering who this Colonel Charles Young was. Most of the trees, ironically, in the in this beautiful park were, were named after uh, American Civil War generals, Union Civil War generals, or presidents from, from that generation. So I figured that Charles Young was, was probably a, a, a white general from the Union, that, you know, that, who served with some distinction. So he deserved to have a, a tree named after him. Wasn't the case at all. Colonel Charles Young was the first African American to graduate from West Point. And uh, graduating from West Point, you know, any way you cut it, it's a major accomplishment. But to do it as a black person, 
in the 1870s was incredibly difficult. They made it as hard as they could for him. They, you know, they, they, they jimmied his test scores. His cadets wouldn't speak to him the entire time he was there. Wouldn't talk to him. But he somehow got through it. He graduated with honors. And then he joined the American Army and was an exemplary soldier. His soldiers underneath him loved him. He, was, he, would, never, he would never go ask people to do what he wouldn't do himself. He was a fantastic uh, officer in the American Army. Had he been white, he probably would have been at least a brigadier general. He was really impressive, really intelligent, incredibly brave, and lots of common sense. So anyway, he had that first already, which, by the way, even the New York Times lambasted the Army for letting a black person graduate from West Point, even the New York Times. But he got through it, and um, then... Several years later, he became the first African-American to be the commandant of a national park. In those days, the army were in the parks. And so he was the, they named him commandant of the Sequoia National Park. And in those days, the, Na the Sequoia National Park was just a name. It meant nothing. You know, these, these sort of logger barons were going in without permits, without permission. They had all these senators in their pockets. And they were cutting down these magnificent sequoia trees and making a killing. You know, they, were, they would make a fortune off each cutting. So Young knew the first thing he had to do was stop that, or there wasn't going to be a park. You know, there wasn't going to be any sequoia trees to have a park about. So he only had a few soldiers under his command. And this was, of course, at a time when the American army was, was really having to just go for the dregs of society to, to get soldiers. No one really wanted to be in the army in those days, in the Gilded Age. So they really weren't into doing what Young wanted to do, which was to stop these, these, these gangs from cutting down the trees. These gangs were coming in with several dozen guys all armed to the teeth and ready to, ready to kill anybody that stopped them. So Young just single-handedly took them on. <laughs> you know, there, there's these crazy stories about they'd, they'd be coming down the road and he'd sort of step out of the bushes, just him, and he'd have his, his, his two Winchester revolvers on his hips. And he'd yell out really loud that... The next one of you takes a step forward, I'm going to shoot. You need to just disperse and go back home, and there won't be any trouble. Just don't come back. And that's how he handled it. They, of course, laughed at him. They called him the N-word, and they, they said they were going to kill him and, then, and, and lynch him and string him up, all that stuff. That's what they yelled at him, back at him. And then he said, yeah, who's going first? Who's making that first step? And then that, you know, they were basically cowards at heart, so they turned around, and he saved those trees. That's what he did. That's how he did it. The senators and stuff and the, the logger barons, they bombed his, ca had his cabin bombed. They threatened his wife. They threatened his kids. But they, they, they stood their ground. <laughs> and uh, eventually they, he saved that park. During all this, the Congress did something right. They, they decided to name a tree after Colonel Young. Colonel Young declined the offer because he felt that there were other African Americans that did more than he did for the cause. So he said, you know, name it after Booker T. Washington. That's what they did. So that's the kind of guy he was. When he passed away, they finally got around to naming this grove after him, one of the smartest things they ever did. So here I am, you know, standing underneath this tree, Colonel Charles Young tree, and I was hot that day, boy. I mean, I was writing good. And I knew there was a song here. I felt it, and I, I knew I had to get it. And I was thinking, okay, God, what, what should I write this song about? I didn't know anything about, about Colonel Young. That would be the obvious thing to write, this, write about, right? But I couldn't think what to say. So I said, God, give me the idea. What should I do? And I don't know why, folks, but all I could think was the Ramones. <laughs> write a song about the Ramones. I'm like, why? I mean, the Ramones, this urban punk rock band in this pristine, what? This makes no sense, God. What? You know, and then I started thinking, wow, you know, the, there's some angles here because the very first Jason and the National Scorchers real tour, like opening for a real band in real venues and stuff, big venues, was opening for the Ramones in Texas in 1982. You can imagine, Mike, you can imagine what that was like. Yeah, right. I mean, we, did, we could hardly even get the van to turn on, you know. Warner's amps didn't work. Jeff didn't have enough money to even get bass strings on his bass. 
They offered us $75 a night in Texas to open for the Ramones. Texas, you know, from Tennessee is a long distance. That was like 800 miles. But we, you know, got our money together. I didn't pay the rent that month and made some baloney excuse to the landlord and had enough money to get to Beaumont, Texas to open for the Ramones, right? This was going to be, this was going to change our lives. We got there, and we were a little bit apprehensive, right, because these were the Ramones. They were really tough punk rockers from, from Queens, and they had a reputation for being pretty tough, nasty people. And we found them to be the exact opposite. I guess they felt sorry for these weird Tennessee, this weird Tennessee band of hillbillies. Because, like, Dee Dee immediately, like, started talking to Jeff, and he gave Jeff some bass strings. <laughs> Joey Ramone invited us all into the dressing room so we could have some of their food. He knew he probably didn't have anything to eat. He was right. And we, you know, wow, we just, we just loaded up those chicken wings, and we put them in our pockets, you know, <laughs> and the Ryder beer, you know. They, were, they had, like, cases and cases of Ryder beer, and that all went in our bags. But... You know, then we started thinking, okay, we're going to go on here in, in 45 minutes. And I started thinking, it was the first time I thought this, how did we get this gig? We're an unknown band. You know, how, why, why, is this, why did this guy from New York give us this gig? And then as we went on stage, we sort of figured it out. There was a tradition in New York in the early 1980s that, that the people would come to the show early to see the opening band, and not to see the opening band, but to absolutely trash the opening band. So nobody really wanted the gig, man. Nobody really wanted to do this gig. So we, before we even hit a single note, our entire stage and us was covered with trash. It was like an avalanche of this nasty trash that they'd brought to the show. This was, you know, in 1981, you could, or 1982, you could do things like that, to trash the opening band. And, you know, I have to say, I've never been more proud of Jason and the Nashville Scorchers than I was that moment. Because what did we do? You know, the professional thing would do is sort of play your songs, kind of stay out of the way and get off the stage. We started yelling back at them. <laughs> we started picking up stuff and throwing them back at the audience. <laughs> of course, it made no impression because there's only four of us throwing at 3,000 people. But we were making a statement. And several of those shows, it happened every night, several of those shows... We, you know, we, we actually ended up getting an encore out of the deal and made fans that are still with us to this day. So anyway, I was like, okay, this is going to work. I can write a song about the Ramones and our sort of, our sort of, you know, experience opening up for them. And then it just hit me. And I came up, I came up with the idea. And I'm so proud of this, folks, that this is the only song in the entire planet Earth that has these two words in it, God and Ramones. The song is called God Bless the Ramones. Well, in the spring of 82, I got a call from this New York dude. He had heard of the Nashville Scorcher, busting doors and lighting torches. This guy offered us a Texas tour. Guaranteed to make us less obscure, it was opening for the Ramones, you see, in the Texas state of Missouri. And though we had no master plan, no amps at work, or a running van, we said yes, and away we went. With $50 past due rent, we drove to Beaumont, Texas first, where all these punks would quench their thirst on bands like Killin' Joke and Black Flag, bartenders all in drag. God bless the Ramones. They never made much money. Folks either hate them or thought that they were funny. God bless the Ramones. They never sold their songs. The U.S. corporate radio and all that it controlled. Well, Dee Dee was the first we met, and Jeff couldn't afford bass strings yet. So Dee Dee gave him extra strings, some Ryder beer, and chicken wings. Then we opened up the show. There was so much we didn't know. Those Texas punks bombarded us with bottles of beer and vile stuff. God bless the Ramones. They never made much money. Most folks either hate them or thought that they were funny. Oh, God bless the Ramones. 
sold their soul the U.S. corporate radio, all that in control. Everyone loves the Ramones with posters of them in their homes And that t-shirt that bankers wear on weekends when they drink and dare But no one's left from that first band to take it in or make a stand And all those years and all those miles they barely spoke and rarely smiled Ten thousand shows they gutted through for a small group of us who knew They were the first and they're still the best I truly stand the punk rock test God bless the Ramones they never made much money Most folks either hated them Or thought that they were funny Oh, God bless the Ramones They never sold their soul The U.S. corporate radio All that in control I said, God bless the Ramones They never made much money Most folks never heard of them Or thought that they were funny God bless the Ramones They never sold their souls the U.S. corporate radio and all that in control. Gabba, gabba, hey! Gabba, gabba, hey! Gabba, gabba, hey! Let me hear you pray. Thank you, folks, and God bless you. By God, I can still rock hard as ever. But it takes longer to recover. All right. Well, after the show, I'll be back there at the table if you want to get pictures and stuff. And you have the, that incredibly cool Jason the National Scorchers LP. I'd like to thank uh, Sean uh, Keenan from WKEI and WKEI for doing the interview to help this show out. Michael Berry with the Kiwani Star Courier, WQUD and Mama C and all the folks there. Uh, Karen Regula for helping promote the show. Um, John E. Morris is back there doing merch. And of course, that's right, Johnny. That's right. That's right. And of course, John Taylor and all the Heartland Connection people once again. have a Western alumni reunion somehow. Maybe at Brothers Pub. That's right. Maybe we can line up Joe and to, to get in on that. I don't think about that. We'll talk about that, Joe. Let's talk about it. Um, once again, let me just repeat. I never left. I never left Bureau County and Henry County and Stark County, this area. I never left it. I'm still here. You know. That's the way it is. Well, you're railroad gate. You know, I just can't jump it. Sometimes it gets so, so hard to see. I'm sitting here, beating on my trumpet. With all these promises you left for me. 
where are you tonight? All right. Listen, I'm very, very painfully aware that me doing this on acoustic guitar without the scorchers is a little weird, okay? I get, I get that, all right? Um, but we can compensate for that if you guys will sing those parts that you were just doing, but a lot louder, okay? <laughs> right? You got to channel Jason and the Scorchers in 1984. All right. So really loud. And if anybody can do like the three-part thing, you know, we could really make this an outstanding experience for the last song of the night. So, you know, I know there's some really talented musical people here tonight. Where are you tonight? Where are you tonight? I was a half sick. I waited for you and you hated me. I waited for you in the Bishop Hill traffic. But I knew I had some other place to be. Here we go. Where are you tonight? Where are you tonight, sweet Marie? I don't know what happened, but the riverboat captain, he knows my fate. Baby, even you maybe are just gonna have to wait. Wait, wait, I've been in shape when all the mail show. A man can't give his address to bad company. I can take it to your house, but I can't unlock it. Do you forgot to leave me with a key? Here we go. Where are you tonight? Where are you tonight, sweet Marie? You've been great. Well, anybody can be just like me, obviously. Then again, not many of them are like her, most fortunately. Fortunately. Six white horses. Yeah, you did promise. I never to the penitentiary. But to live outside the law, you must be honest. Darling, I know you'll always say that you'll agree. One more time. Where are you tonight? Where are you tonight, sweet Marie? Where are you tonight? Where are you tonight? Where are you tonight, sweet Marie? Thank you from the bottom of my heart for sharing this bond tonight, to helping me make music and appreciating what I'm doing, and for just being so cool. God bless you.